In the last episode, we talked about open address hashing as a way to deal with collisions uh, within a hash table. Uh, so, uh, with uh, open address hashing, basically uh, the way it works is that you compute a hash value based on some key, um, and then um, you search to see whether or not the array element at that uh, hash value is occupied. If it is, then uh, then you tr you use a probing function to find a vacant position and insert the key or insert the op the uh, um, the object at that um, at that location. Um, all right. So another way for dealing with um, collisions um, instead of using open address hashing is to use something called chained hashing. Um, so let's uh, look at that idea. So with chaining, what you want to be able to do is say, okay, let's just allow the collision to occur and let's store the element at that location regardless of whether or not it's, it's um, occupied or not. And so the way that this happens then is that uh, each one of the locations in the array isn't actually something storing an element but rather storing a pointer to some other data structure. So you can store, for instance, a linked list or a binary search tree or whatever it is that you want to at that, uh, at that particular location. And so the hash function then will just go ahead and map to uh, whatever the location is, and then you use this chained um, hashing idea to store multiple elements at that location. So for instance, here's a diagram that shows chaining. Um, and so if I have three elements, A2, B2, and C2, all of those, all of which um, hash to location two in the array, then I can just use, I will use a, um, a linked list to store all of those elements at that location. Same thing goes with elements that map to five and location nine and so forth. Now there's another approach called coalesced hashing uh, where uh, you basically store uh, elements using a, um, a the same basic idea of having a, a linked list, but instead of creating a linked list, uh, a separate linked list, you actually go ahead and store the elements in the array, but you store them in a, in a different location um, rather than um, in a contiguous location in the in the array. So. With coalesced hashing, the way that it works is that uh, when you encounter a collision, you um, store the next element at the end of the array, so in the very last location in the array, but then have a pointer from the, uh, place, the place where it hashed to um, to indicate that you know, I, I didn't store it in this location, but then I stored it in some other location. So here's an example with coalesced hashing. So these three elements hash their normal locations. These have, uh, B5 has a collision uh, with A5, so it, it gets stored at the end of the array. Um, but then there's a pointer that's created that goes from A5 to that last location. When A9 gets stored, uh, there's a collision with B5, and so the, the next available, or the last available location in the array would be uh, location 8. Uh, and then there would be a pointer to go back to that previous location there. And, and then finally with B2, there's a collision here, so the next to last avail available location is B2. So um, this uh, coalesced hashing thing works then by uh, finding the last element, last available element in the array and storing the element there. So if we go ahead and then try to store B9, um, there's a collision with location 9, and so it tries to find the next available location, and that would be location 6. It stores it there. But then it has to do, there has to be this sort of, this, uh, these link back, these links back to show where the uh, element should be stored. Another approach for um, dealing with collisions is to use something called bucket addressing. So instead of having, um, just a single array with an index. Uh, you have a two-dimensional array, uh, and the number of columns is based on, on 
you know, how many things you actually want to store. Um, and then what you do is as you have collisions, you just add them to the next column in the, uh, in the array. If you have a collision, uh, then it just goes into the same row. If, if we were to add something to A2 and we have another collision, we would add it to the next row and the next available element in that next row. Uh, okay, so we've talked primarily about adding things to a hash table. Uh, we've talked also about how to find elements in a hash table. Um, the uh, other thing that we need to be able to do is delete things from a hash table. Uh, and basically we use the same um, hashing method that we would use when finding or adding an item. So you compute the hash value, you check the location in the array based on the hash, uh, hash value, uh, and then you, uh, then you have to find that element and then remove it. Uh, and so it might not be actually in the very, in the very first place you look, so you have to use linear probing, linear probing or whatever other technique that you're using to store elements in the array. Um, now, if we simply delete the item um, from the array, then um, you're going to end up having an error when, when using probing because you'll, uh, let's say I want to delete B2 from this array, but I've already deleted A2. Or sorry, let's say I want to find B2 and I've deleted A2. So B2 is going to hash to this location here and it's going to see that it's empty, so it's going to say, oh, it's not in the array. Um, and so. Uh, it's going to stop the search uh, immediately. But we know that B2 is actually in the array already, and so uh, you know, when we get to this location, we need to have some other way to mark to say that, hey, you know, I deleted this item, but there is actually something else in the array that, or there are other things in the chain or that are potentially in the chain that have to be searched. Okay, so we need some other method other than to just simply delete the element. Um, and so uh, one of the techniques that you can use is to replace a deleted item with a dummy element to indicate that, um, you know, I've deleted this thing, but there may be other things that are in the chain that will, uh, that will you know, be the element that you're going to find. So uh, we put the, this dummy D2 in here so that when we do the search for B2, we'll hit this element and we'll say, okay, there's nothing here, but there's other things potentially in the chain. And so it'll do this linear search until it finds B2 to say, okay, yeah, it is actually in the, in the array. So the key then to deletion is to just make sure that you're, you're replacing the element with something that maps to or indicates that there is a, um, that there was something here, but there is now nothing here, but that there's something in the chain. All right, so... Um, as far as time analysis of, um, of hash tables is concerned, um, there's a number of uh, things that we need to address uh, that, that are concerned with, um, with a time analysis, or at least an indication of you know, how, how many accesses is it required to actually find something in, uh, in the array when you're using hashing. The worst case for hashing is when all the keys hash to the same index and you end up getting a linear search, uh, which is big O of n. So that's actually not too bad, I suppose. Um, the best case for hashing, in, which is sort of the ideal, is when all the keys hash to different indices. So if you have perfect hashing functions, then you will get this best case hashing where you'll have basically, you know, you'll find the element in your first access, which would be ideal. You'd have an order one. Uh, computation. Uh, the average case analysis actually gives us a better picture of what actually happens real in reality and that's what we'll take a look at uh, here. And actually uh, there's uh, some discussion of this in the textbook in uh, chapter 10.2. Uh, okay, so uh, an important factor or important issue in um, uh, in hash tables uh, when using open address hashing is this idea of a load factor. So a load factor for a hash table is defined as the, uh, the ratio of the number of elements in the table um, over the size of the table's array. Um, and uh, basically what this tells you is how full the, um, how full the hash table is. Uh, one of the things that we'll find is as the, f as the table becomes 
uh, becomes filled as you get closer to a load factor of one for open address hashing that the uh, the average time to actually find things in the table uh, starts to increase uh, as different clusters start to form. Now, if you're using something like chaining or open, or sorry, chaining or bucket addressing, then uh, alpha could actually be larger than one because you know you can actually have more elements in the table than the size of the actual array. Now, with uh, open address hashing, when using linear probing, um, when you have a non-full hash table and you don't allow rem removals, the, number, the average number of table elements that are examined or the number of accesses is defined by this ratio here. Uh, so half uh, times 1 plus 1 over 1 minus alpha. And this is just a, an approximation of how many, um, how many elements will be um, visited or how many locations will be visited. In practice, it may actually be uh, different, uh, especially if you're adding numbers randomly into, or adding elements randomly into uh, into your table. Um, so, you know, if I have 800 items in a table of capacity 1,000, then one minus alpha is going to be 0.2. Um, so, you know, you end up having, you know, a uh, you know your average time of to access is. Um, let's see, one half plus, uh, let's see, that would be three, so it'd be, it'd be essentially be uh, about uh, uh, 1.5 accesses, I believe. Uh, let me do, I, anyway, I should do the calculation on it. But anyway, so a, a problem that I could ask you on an exam, for instance, is this thing right here. So if I have 800 items in capacity 1,000, uh, let me just quickly do the calculation here. Um, of, uh, of this, so uh, the the answer here. Let's see, one half plus one over one over point two. That's five. That's six. So the answer is three. So uh, you know, as my table gets full, you know, two capacity. So I have about eighty percent uh, load factor on this. Uh, the number of times I need to actually. Uh, access different array elements to actually find something is going to be about three. And, that, and ideally, we want to be down closer to one, so uh, what you would want to do then is per perhaps have a table that is larger than, much larger than the number of items that you're going to store. The trade-off there, of course, is space. You know, how large do you actually want to have the array be? So let's take a look at an example of this. Um, Uh, with uh, this tool here. So uh, if I just randomly add elements in here, you'll see that the load factor goes up. Um, so if I get a load factor of about 0.7 and I check to see what the average access time is, at least with this example, the average access time is 1.5 uh, for, this, for this particular sequence of numbers that were added and for a, an array that's size 200. If I actually do the access on this number 368, um, you'll see here that this one actually had two accesses in order to find an element. Uh, if I, let me see if I can find something that had a far larger number of accesses. Oh, here you th we have one. Actually, the, see here, the thing's kind of wrapped, um, but this is still a 200 element uh, table. But you see here that we have this cluster where you started searching here, but then it actually found the element here. Nine total accesses in order to find this. Uh, but on the average for this particular table um, and uh, for the values that I've added here, um, the, um, the average access time uh, is uh, 1.5. Um, and let's see, let's look at some other ones here. This one found it immediately in that one location. But anyway, so as the load factor increases, let's get up closer to a load factor of 0.8 uh, and then check this average access. So at least with this particular example, the access average was 2.2. You see here that there's some fairly large clusters that are being uh, created here. Um, let me see if I can find, let me add something to this. Uh, let me add, 
Now, let me add the number 5 to this. It should end up being added here. And if I don't already have it in the, um, if I don't ha already have the number 5 in here, the, this, the number of accesses for this is going to increase quite a bit. Let's see if I can find, oh, 5 is already in here. So let's try um, 205. Add that and find 205. Um, I think something's going on here. Well, here is 5. 205, uh, 205 is already in here as well. Um, so I need to find a good number that. Uh, let's try 2005. Let me add that. And let me do a find on 2005. The number of accesses for that is going to be 41. So I get this really long chain that starts searching here. Ends here. Uh, and let's see what that does to my access average. Yeah, that brings that thing up to 2.5. Anyway, so um, the, the performance of these hash tables uh, sort of improves as the uh, if the load factor is low for uh, the table. Um, so anyway, there's other computations that were done in textbook. They did some computations based on double hashing uh, as well as uh, quadratic pro um, probing. I also have some other data for doing uh, the average time of chaining. So in open address hashing with chained hashing, the average number of table elements is 1 plus the load factor over 2. Uh, and then you can do the computation, obviously, for that uh, using the previous example of having 800 elements in a 1,000 element um, table. Anyway, here's a portion of the table for that was found in the textbook on the performance of hash tables. Um, you'll see here is uh, with open address hashing and double hashing, the number of elements that you can actually put into the table is limited by the array size. Chained hashing allows you to put put more than uh, more than just uh, the well, you can put more elements in the table than the table size. So that's why you can compute uh, uh, these access averages for um, chained hashing uh, when load factors are above one. And if you look here at the performance with chained hashing, your, your performance actually is still pretty good, uh, uh, even though you have a very full table. So that sort of points to perhaps using chained hashing as your approach uh, for doing hash tables. All right, so anyway, that uh, concludes uh, this episode um, on, on hashing, and it includes, this concludes the, all the lectures on hashing as well.